course, we're on Unit 1, studying the Bhagavad Gita, first six chapters. Okay, so we'll begin with the slide presentation. Everyone can see the slides okay? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So yes, this is lesson, lesson number two. Dharma Shetri. Right? Dharma in Bhagavad Gita. Review. Yesterday we spoke about the liberal nature of Brahmanas. Who was that Brahmana who was very liberal? Right. right. Yes. And he's not supposed to be the only Brahmana liberal. It's supposed to be the nature of Brahmanas. All Brahmanas are meant to be liberal. To sacrifice themselves for others. So Dronacharya, he gave mercy to? Right. Okay. And then we had examples of Duryodhana's diplomacy. He was a very diplomatic person in his dealings. And he was inspiring his great warriors to go out there and fight in the middle of the Kurukshetra war. And he was encouraging Drona and Bhishma and Karna and all of these people that they should fight. And he warned them also about the dangers they were facing. And then we spoke about Arjuna and his flag with uh, Hanuman on the flag. And then at the end of the class we talked a little bit about Arjuna ordering Krishna. And Krishna taking the order and following Arjuna's instructions. Okay, then we also spoke about Vaishnavas and violence. Prabhupada's statement regarding Vaishnavas and violence, that sometimes Vaishnavas may have to use violence in the service of Krishna. Although it's not a very common thing, that sometimes it may happen. And then we, we had also at the, the beginning Prabhupada's mood and mission, as described in the preface to the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's mood and mission, mood that if even one devotee could become a devotee, he would consider it a success. And his mission to present the Bhagavad Gita in a manner in which people could understand it and appreciate the, the mood of devotion which is presented in the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada said there are so many other editions of Bhagavad Gita, but they do not touch on the real spirit of the Bhagavad Gita. They don't emphasize the importance of devotion, and they don't recognize Lord Krishna also. They don't recognize the actual position of Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada's mission is to reveal these things through the writing of, through his uh, presentation of the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, we'll go ahead. Right. Here's the, from the first verse, we spoke about the field of religion, Kurukshetra, the battlefield, was a field of religion. And here, oh my goodness, what's going on? Here's a verse from 18th chapter at the end, we were speaking previously about uh, Dharma and it's mentioned in the 18th chapter, Dharmyam Samvadam, Lord Krishna, uh, uh, I who is it speaking here? I declare that he who studies this sacred conversation of ours so it must be Lord Krishna worships me by his intelligence. So that is the meaning of dharmyam samvadam. That we're actually, if we study this Bhagavad Gita, then we're actually worshipping Krishna. 
it's as good as worshipping Krishna. Just like you go to the temple and you may worship the deity, we can worship Lord Krishna also through the Bhagavad Gita, by studying this Bhagavad Gita. This is proper use of our intelligence and this is a very effective way of worshipping Lord Krishna. He's satisfied when we worship Krishna in this way. Okay, we're going to look at the main elements of the first chapter. So it began with Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra had a doubt, right? What was it doubt? What doubt did Dhritarashtra have? The quality of his friend. Yeah, yes, one About the victory of his son. He wanted to know, first of all, he was doubtful, maybe my sons will compromise. He was worried that his sons may compromise and they may make peace with the Pandavas. They may not fight at all. That was one concern he had, that he wanted that the battle should take place because he was confident that his sons were going to be victorious. So Dhritarashtra was, was concerned that his sons didn't compromise, that they didn't just simply go there and make peace, that they would actually fight. So that was one doubt Dhritarashtra had. And then verses 3 to 11 describe the diplomatic dealings of Duryodhan, how he's encouraging his side, his warriors. He wants to bring out the best in them. At the same time, he wants them to be aware of the Kauravas, uh, rather the Pandavas. He wants to be aware of the enemy. He wants them to know their strength. And then we spoke about the signs of victory for the Pandavas, right? What, what were the four signs of victory? The flag of Hare. 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 The chariot. The chariot. Yeah. Uh, Lashmi, like uh, the goddess of fortune, mm -hmm. and Krishna on the chariot, and Krishna on the side of the Pandavas, chariot from the uh, Lord Agni, mm -hmm. and Hanuman on the flag. Mm -hmm. What about Kurukshetra? Yeah, Kurukshetra. Too. Because Kurukshetra is Dharma Kshetra, Dharma Kshetra. So Kurukshetra is a holy place. That's also. Uh, significant to the Pandavas because the Pandavas are righteous, they're religious mo much more than the Kauravas. So that was to the advantage of the Pandavas. And then text 21 to 27, we read about Lord Krishna as Bhakta Vatsala. Bhakta Vatsala meaning? What's the meaning? Bhakta Vatsala? Lord is protective towards his devotees. Very dear to his devotees. Very dear to his devotees. The Lord is dear to his devotees. And the devotees. Affectionate, affectionate to his devotees. Well, devotee is dear to the Lord. The devotees are dear to the Lord. The Lord is dear to the devotees. Yeah. And so Bhakta Vatsala means that Krishna will reciprocate with his devotees according to their devotion. Lord Krishna is going to respond to them as they approach him. Lord Krishna will respond to them. He deals with his devotees as they approach him. So Arjuna was approaching Krishna as his friend, but also he wanted somebody to drive his chariot. So Lord Krishna accepted, he wanted to do that service for Arjuna. He wanted to be with Arjuna throughout the battle and then he could guide him, and support him, encourage him. So Lord Krishna enjoys loving relationships with his devotees. That's why he's Bhaktavatthala that loving reciprocation. And then from verse number 27 to the end of the chapter, text 46, we're going to hear Arjuna's four reasons 
for not fighting. We'll go through these this afternoon, the four different reasons Arjuna had why he didn't want to take part in the battle. All right, so this is the structure of the first chapter. We'll go ahead. All right, Bhishma Drona Pramukhata, in front of Bhishma and Drona, right? We remember we were reading text 22 and 23, and we were hearing Arjuna request Krishna. What did Arjuna request Krishna to do? Yes, why? Brother, they so can see the family whom he is fighting. Who came to fight with him? Right, he wants to see who's there, who's going to fight with them. Let me see who's all come here. And so, Lord Krishna drove the chariot in such a manner that it, be, it came right in front of Bhishma and Drona. And naturally, Arjuna became overwhelmed by that sight of his beloved teacher and his grandfather. Grandfathers are more merciful than the father. Srila Prabhupada used to tell us, he said that Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, he's your spiritual grandfather. And so that he said the grandfather is more merciful than the father. Father will be strict, but the grandfather will be more kind. So Arjuna appreciated his grandfather, he had an affectionate relationship with Bhishma. And then Drona, of course, Arjuna is the personal, the, the best student of Drona. And Drona had promised Arjuna that he would be the best archer, nobody would equal him. So there was very strong dealings, very strong bonds of affection between Arjuna and Bhishma and Drona. And then, Pashyaitan Samavetan Kurun Iti. Just behold the Kurus. Right, the Kurus. So they're all relatives, the cousins of the Pandavas. They're all there, all 100 of them along with all of their allies, they've all come there to fight. So it's certainly a very intense, overwhelming situation for Arjuna. So Arjuna begins uh, with his different reasons why he doesn't want to fight. Arjuna Vishada Yoga, his reasons why he doesn't want to take part in the battle. So the first reason comes in text number 27. Would someone like to read text 27 for me, please? Yes, Guru, Guru. 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 Compassion. Uh, so make sure. Hare Krishna, please, Dhruva Prabhu, let, let Dhruva Prabhu read. Rest, please, mute your bell. Uh, reading. Dhruva, Dhruva, Dhruva. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're already moving. Tan, tan sa miksha sa kaunte ya sarvan bandun ava ava Avishyatan Kaya Paraya Vishto Vishidan Idam Abravit. Read translation. Yes, your Sanskrit is very nice. Go ahead, read the translation. Translation. When the son of Kunti, Arjuna, so all these different grades of friends and relatives, he became overwhelmed with compassion and spoke thus. All right. So Arjuna became overwhelmed with compassion on account of seeing all of his 
friends and relatives who've all assembled there desiring to fight. It's helpful to refer to, to the book, <coughs> excuse me, it's help, <coughs> helpful to refer to the book, Surrender Unto Me. Surrender Unto Me by Burijan Prabhu, and he analyzes all the different relationships, the different people who are there, the friends, the relatives, diff whatever different relationships they have. And he mentions the names of all the different people. So you might like to look at that and just appreciate how all the different relationships which are there. Everyone's come there to take part in the battle. So Arjuna looks on everyone and he becomes overwhelmed with compassion. Compassion, of course, is a quality of a devotee. Devotee, every morning when we offer prayers, when we offer our obeisances to the devotees, we talk about compassion, right? We offer our obeisances to all the devotees of the Lord uh, who are just like desire trees, who can fulfill the desires of everyone and are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. So a Vaishnava is compassionate for the fallen conditioned souls. And here, Arjuna on the battlefield, he's also compassionate. He's feeling compassion for, for both sides. He's reluctant to take part in the battle. He thinks, you know, compassion, we should be, we should be compassionate on them. And if we're going to fight, we'll injure them and kill them. It's not compassionate. So this is one reason Arjuna has for not fighting. Compassion is a very important quality which we should also be cultivating as devotees. When we go out for Sankirtan, we should have that mood of compassion, that we want to give the holy name on the fallen souls. We want to bring them, awaken them to Krishna consciousness. However, do you think it's, is it relevant for Arjuna to be compassionate on the battlefield? Hare Krishna. Yes, please, Mukesh, please go on. No, Maharaj, battlefield is not a place for compassion. The dharma for a Kshatriya is to kill or be killed in the uh, battlefield. A Brahm, like for a Brahmana, it would be much more relevant, but for for a Kshatriya, I don't think that this would be very uh, relevant. Mm, yes, yes, right. Good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the, ne the next uh, reason for not fighting, Arjuna's, Arjuna's worried about enjoyment. Arjuna said, if I fight, I won't enjoy. There'll be no enjoyment for me. So, you know, the impetus for everything which we do, there must be some enjoyment. Even this Bhakti Shastri course, we hope you, you can get some enjoyment from it. Studying the, the Bhagavad Gita and appreciating what's going on, and there should be some enjoyment there. Otherwise, why? We should do anything. There should be some pleasure derived from it. Would someone like to read for me, please? Text number 30 to 35 of the ch first chapter. Translation. I am now unable to stand here any longer. 
I am forgetting myself and my mind is reeling. I see only cause, causes of misfortune. O oh, Krishna, killer of the Keshi demon. Go ahead. Text 31. Nacha Shreyo Nupashyami Nihatva Svajana Mahave Nakakshe Vijayam Krishna Nacha Rajyam Sukhanucha I do not see how any good can come from killing my own kinsmen in this battle. Nor can I, my dear Krishna, desire any subsequent victory, kingdom or happiness. Yes. 32 to 33. Kim no rajena govinda, Kim ko kerji, jiviti nava, yesham, arthe kangshitam no rajam hoga, sukhanicha, tae me vashchita yute, pranams vekva, tananicha, acharya pitraha putras, tataeva cha pitamaha, motulaha, swasharaha patraha, shala. Translation O Govinda, of what avail to us our kingdom, happiness, or even life itself? when all those for whom we may desire them are now arrayed on this battlefield? O Madhusudan, when teachers, fathers, sons, grandfathers, maternal uncles, fathers-in-law, grandsons, brothers-in-law, and other relatives are ready to give up their lives and properties and are standing before me, why should I wish to kill them, even though they might otherwise kill me? O maintainer of all living entities, I am not prepared to fight with them, even in exchange for the three worlds, let alone this world. What pleasure will we derive from killing the sons of Dhritarashtra? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well read. So, the main point there is, Arjuna is questioning, he said, what pleasure will there be there in fighting? I am not going to enjoy it. It's not going to bring me any satisfaction. Why I should, therefore, why I should do it? Sometimes we feel like that. <laughs> going to school. As a young child, I used to say, I, I don't want to go to school. I don't, I don't want to go there. <laughs> No pleasure there, no enjoyment. So Arjuna is on the battlefield and he's thinking also, why I should fight? I'm not going to enjoy. Where is the enjoyment for Arjuna? Anyone? How you can argue against this? Yes? Anyone like to offer? Yes, Manjiri Devi. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, anything we enjoy with our friends and relatives, that's the first thing. The first thing of the enjoyment we get happiness through friends and relatives, either devotees or Vaishnavas, amongst them only. So he is thinking about losing them, so that's why there is no enjoyment for him. Okay. Well, that's the only enjoyment he has, just being with his friends? Yes, Rishishtra. Yes, <coughs> I think the enjoyment for a Kshatriya is, or anyone is, to be engaged in their specific duty and to get a chance to be able to do their duty properly. And that's what Krishna in the next chapter actually hints at him, that even if you die, still it's a happy situation because the doors of heaven are open for you. Hare Krishna. Okay. Even if you die, doors of heaven, that's right. That's, that's one reason why... Uh, Krishna spoke that verse, 
because Arjuna is saying that if I fight, I won't enjoy. But Lord Krishna says, well, even if you lose, even if you're ki killed on the battlefield, what will happen? It will open the doors to heaven, right? Arjuna, if he dies on the battlefield, that's a, that's a desirable death for a Kshatriya, to give up the body on the battlefield, going forward. And so Lord Krishna is saying, fight. Even you kill, even you don't win the battle, you lose the battle, you'll go to heaven. You'll attain the heavenly planets. Well, of course, we may say as devotees, well, we don't want to go to heaven. That's not enjoyment for us. We're devotees. <laughs> we want to go back to Godhead. Okay, and then here's another reason, third reason, sinful reactions. All right, we want someone to read text number 36. Yes, Papam eva shaye dasman Hatvaitan atatainaha Tasma naraha vayam hantum Dritarashtram sabandavan Swajanam hi katam hatva Sukina shyama madava Sin will overcome us if we slay such aggressors. Therefore, it is not proper for us to kill the sons of Dhritarashtra and our friends. What should we gain, O Krishna, husband of the goddess of fortune? And how could we be happy by killing our own kingsmen? Yes, sin will overcome us. So Arjuna is worried about sinful reactions for fighting, killing people. Just like all of us as devotees, we should be very conscious about sinful reactions. Very careful. We don't want to do anything sinful because that's going to be a big uh, obstacle. It's going to de 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 stop our spiritual progress. And so we're also worried about sinful reactions and we want to therefore always stay acting in the proper manner. All right, can you read text 43 and 44 also, Mariji? 43 and 44. Yes, Radhita Mataji. Yes, Oh Krishna, maintainer of the people. I have heard by disciplic succession that those whose family traditions are destroyed dwell always in hell. 44. Aho bata mahat papam kartum vyavashita vayam yad rajya sukalo bhena hantum swajana mutyataha. Alas, how strange is that we are preparing to commit greatly sinful acts driven by the desire to enjoy royal happiness. We are intent to killing our own kinsmen. Yes, Arjuna is concerned that maybe we're just, what we just want to kill our own kinsmen for the sake of our own enjoyment. So he's, he is aware that there will be certainly sinful reactions for such an action. All right, now we want to read second chapter, verse number five. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Guru Nahatva Himahanu Bhavan Shreyo Bhoktum Bhiksham Api Haloke Hatvar Takamams to Guru Nihaiva Gunji Abhogan Rudira Pradhikdan it would be better to live in this world by begging than to live at the cost of the lives of great souls who are my teachers. Even though desiring worldly gain, they are superiors. If they are killed, everything we enjoy will be tainted with blood. Thank you, Maharaj. Oh. 
Arjuna is analyzing the situation, everything will be tainted with blood. Oh, certainly, we wouldn't enjoy that. It wouldn't be a very pleasant situation if everything is tainted with blood. So Arjuna is showing very nice qualities. He's worried about these kind of things, sinful reactions and so on. And there's one more reason we want to look at. Number four, destruction of the dynasty. Beginning with text number 37 of the first chapter and going up to 43. Would someone like to read for us? Translation by Shila Prabhupada. O Janardana, although these men, their hearts overtaken by greed, see no fault in killing one's family or quarreling with friends, why should we, who can see the crime in destroying a family, engage in these acts of sin? Yes, go ahead. Kulakshaye pranashchanti kula dharma sanatana dharme naste kulam krishnam adharmo abhibhavati yuta with the destruction of the dynasty, the eternal family tradition is vanquished, and thus the rest of the family becomes involved in a religion. Adharma vibhavach krishna pradushanti kulastriya strishu dushta su vashneya jayadevarna sankaraha When a religion is prominent in the family, O Krishna, the women of the family become polluted, and from the degradation of womanhood, O descendant of Vrishni, comes unwanted progeny. Shankaro naraka naraka yeva kulagnanam kulasya cha patanti pitrohe esham lupta pindu toka kriya ha. An increase of unwanted population certainly causes hellish life, both for the family and for those who destroy the family tradition. The ancestors of such kind of families fall down because the performance for offering them food and water are entirely stopped. By the evil deeds of those who destroy the family tradition and thus give rise to unwanted children, all kinds of community projects and family welfare activities are devastated. Utsanna kula dharmana manushyanam janardana narake niyatam vaso bhava Hiti Anushushuma, O Krishna, maintainer of the people, I have heard by the disciplic succession that those whose family tradition are destroyed dwell always in hell. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Very nice. We're going to look at this destruction of the dynasty. We'll, we'll look at that in more detail in a minute. Uh, first of all, going back to compassion, Karpanya para. Paraya Vishto. Karpaya, by compassion. Paraya, of a high grade. Avishta, overwhelmed. When the son of Kunti Arjuna saw all three different grades, all these different grades of friends and relatives, he became overwhelmed with compassion. So Arjuna is a family man, he's a Kshatriya, but he's a family man, he has his wife, he has children, so, so he has feelings for people, he has friends and relatives, the relative relationships are there, so he has feelings for these different people. And coming into the middle of the battlefield, he becomes overwhelmed. Enjoyment. Kimboger. O Govinda, of what avail to us our kingdom, happiness, or even life itself, when all those for whom we may desire them are now arrayed on this battlefield? What pleasure will we derive from killing the sons of Dhritarashtra? 
So Arjuna is thinking, what's the point to do something if there's no pleasure in it? Why we should take the, why we should go to this, uh, this extreme to kill people, uh, particularly our own relatives? Well, can there be any real pleasure there? Prabhupada explains in, from the purport, text 32 to 35, everyone wants to show his opulence to friends and relatives, but Arjuna fears that all his relatives and friends will be killed on the battlefield and he will be unable to share his opulence after victory. That is the enjoyment, that you show what you have. As Prabhupada said, we want to show our opulence to friends and relatives. If you have a new car, you'll show it, to, you'll show it off to people. You have a new house, you'll invite people, come and see our new house, you know. We want to show, we, we enjoy, we take pleasure in showing these things. But Arjuna said, if I fight and kill everyone, then how will I be able to share this with anyone? There'll be no one left, everyone will be dead. So there'll be, there's no one to show it off to, I won't enjoy. This is Arjuna's argument from a lecture on the first chapter, text 31, given by Srila Prabhupada in London. Prabhupada is saying, he is thinking Krishna is not so important. My family is important. Although he is devotee, therefore Kanista Adhikari. In the lower stage, in the lower stage of devotion, one may be interested in Krishna consciousness. But his real interest is how to improve this material life. Can you understand Prabhupada's analysis of the situation? Prabhupada is describing Arjuna's thinking. Arjuna is putting himself into this condition, this Kanista Adhikari stage, which is, uh, some places Prabhupada describes it as third class devotee. Or here is, he said, the lower stage. There's an interest in Krishna consciousness. But his main interest is something else. His main interest is to improve material life. So when we think about enjoyment, that's what, it, what it's like. It comes to material life. We're not thinking about Krishna. We're thinking about enjoying. All right. Then going ahead. Sinful reactions. Papam eva shrayad asman. Papam, vices. Eva certainly, ashrayat, must come upon asman, us. Sin will overcome us if we slay such aggressors. Sin will overcome us. Arjuna is also concerned, he doesn't want to be burdened with sinful reactions. Why should we unnecessarily accept so many sinful reactions? And certainly reactions for killing people will be very, very big, big, severe reactions. So Arjuna is very thoughtful about the situation. Should we take part in this battle or not? He's thinking about it very carefully. Arjuna's devotion, that he's very thoughtful. He does not just rush into the situation and go out there and fight without thinking. Now, sometimes we have that problem, we're too impulsive. We don't think clearly, we don't make decisions 
out there. We just like the, they have that advertisement, just do it. But that is not the devotee mode. Think carefully, what should we do? Should I fight or not? We have to decide. So what are the pros and what are the cons? He's looking at the, the different sides of it. Okay, destruction of the dynasty. First, text number 39 describes the first stage in the destruction of the dynasty begins with the death of the family elders. Where are they all going to die? What's going to happen? Why are they all going to die? Is it a pandemic? Is there some COVID disease? Everybody's going to die? All the elders are going to die? What's the problem? Why the death of the family elders? Is it just old age? They all die? Old age? Yes? Somebody yes. answer? Uh, Arjuna and Krishna are standing in the middle of the battlefield. Uh, all the family members, elders, younger ones, everybody is there. So they are about to die. The war. Yes, right. The war. They are going out to fight. They are going into battle. And the, when the Kshatriyas go into battle, they go out with that kind of mood that either they will conquer or they will die on the battlefield. They don't like to go home defeated. Or they have that kind of policy, that kind of uh, contract is like written into them. They're trained up in that way. That when they go out to fight, either they will win or die on the battlefield. So the death of the family elders, the older people are going to go out to fight and they're going to, many are going to die in the battle. In fact, probably all of them are going to die. And so with the death of the family elders, then what will happen? What will be the result when the elders all die? Yes, Stopping of purifying processes in the family. Yes, the, effect, the eternal family tradition is vanquished. Uh, we often see in families like this it, today also, it's common. In the past there would be some tradition, family traditions, but gradually, gradually, with the death of the elders, the tradition is lost. So many different traditions may be there in the family, but gradually with the passage of time and the, with the death of the elders, the family tradition is lost. This is a big problem. We lose our culture. We give up the traditions. And then next, when we give up the tradition, then the family becomes involved in irreligion. Because if they've given up the, the old tradition, the religious pious tradition, and they've taken up some other tradition, often irreligious. They take up so many sinful activities like gambling and intoxication and meat eating, these things. And, and in this way, the family becomes involved in irreligious activities. We see families, they get together and they, they play cards with each other, they gamble. The family members come together, they get intoxicated together. And the family tradition, that is forgotten about. That's all gone, just lost in the course of time. 
then when the family becomes involved in irreligion, then the next stage is degradation of womanhood. What happens? The family becomes involved in irreligion, the men go gambling and drinking and whatever, and then the women come along and they want to do the same. The women also want to go, to, to go gambling and drinking and doing all kinds of materialistic sense gratification. So this is the way of the material world. And this is the common cycle which we go through in the course of the destruction of our dynasties. So when the women become degraded, because the women are also going, maybe drinking and gambling and so on, and then the, the next result is, because the women are doing these irreligious activities, so they, they also become exploited and you get unwanted progeny, what in Sanskrit is known as a Varna Shankara. Prabhupada translates Varna Sankara as unwanted population. So this is a serious problem in the world to prevent the degradation of women, to try to protect women. Women should be properly married. But in order for women to be properly married, you have to have qualified men. And the problem today in the world is there's, there's n not really enough men qualified to take care of a woman. The men are not qualified. And because there's not enough men, the women are left and they're, they, they're exploited. And then when women are exploited, then you get these unwanted progeny, children. Women have to bring up children without their father. And the child grows up only knowing his mother, never had a real home, so he doesn't have real experience of a spiritual family. All right, are there any questions about this? Okay, number six, from verse number 42. Community projects and family welfare activities devastated. The women have become degraded. You've got unwanted progeny. In other words, the children have very poor qualities because the children are born in an irreligious manner. So, Children born in an irreligious manner, you cannot expect them to be great souls. You cannot expect that, there will be, that they will be pure souls because it's outside of marriage. So you're not going to get a very pure soul in such a situation. And when the children are unqualified, they're very... They have, they're very materialistic and they have no interest in culture or traditions. And the, then the community projects and the fam family welfare activities all stop. They all stop because it's going, it's actually these, these uh, different projects and welfare activities are meant to be looked after by the family members. But you don't have, you don't have strong family bonds anymore. Everyone's become lazy and irreligious. So the whole situation, everything declines. Very fallen, miserable condition. Okay, here's Arjuna in the middle of the battlefield with Lord Krishna. This is text number 46. Arjuna cast aside his bow and arrows, his mind overwhelmed with grief. 
How would you feel? How would we feel if we were in that situation? Definitely. It must have been an immensely emotional situation. His mind overwhelmed with grief. Even though Arjuna is a great soul, Maharati, and he has his weapons, the Gandiva bow and everything. But still, even for him, he, his mind was overwhelmed with grief. So we want to try to appreciate this situation. Here's a quotation from Prabhupada's introduction. Can someone read this for me, please? Being an associate of Lord Krishna, Arjuna was above all ignorance. But Arjuna was put into ignorance on the battlefield of Purankshetra. Just to question Lord Krishna about the problems of life so that the Lord could explain them for the benefit of future generation of human beings and chart out, out the plan of life. Then man could act accordingly and perfect the mission of human life. Thank you. It's from the introduction. So Prabhupada is explaining how Arjuna was put into ignorance, just so Krishna could speak this Bhagavad Gita. Sometimes Prabhupada would give the example, he said, just like the mother will instruct her daughter-in-law by instructing her own daughter. In the joint family tradition, the oldest son gets married and he would bring his wife to come and stay in the home. And so the wife comes to stay in the home and she's not familiar with the ways of the mother, her mother-in-law, her new husband's mother. And so the new mother, the mother-in-law, she, she's, she knows the girl is sensitive because she's away from home and she's come to live in their home. So she's aware of the sensitive of the matter. So she does not directly instruct the daughter-in-law, but she will instruct her own daughter. And by instructing her own daughter, then the daughter-in-law will also understand what is the desire of her mother-in-law. So in the same way, Lord Krishna is instructing Arjuna. As Prabhupada said, Arjuna was above all ignorance, but Arjuna was put into ignorance just so he could question Lord Krishna. And that way you have the Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Pradushyanti Kula. Adharma bi bhavat krishna pradushyanti kula striya strishu dusht ashu vashneya jayate varna shankaraha. Text number 40. When irreligion is prominent in the family, O Krishna, the women of the family become polluted. And from the degradation of womanhood, O descendant of Vrishni, comes unwanted progeny. So one of the major causes of prime, uh, crime in the world, in the Western society anyway, one of the main causes of crime are from children from this kind of background, where they're unwanted progeny. They grow up in a one one family. <coughs> they they grow up in a one family situation. They don't have a normal upbringing. They don't have a mother and father. Maybe <coughs> they're brought up with their mother. Just so it's very easy for them to go astray and to go into crime and take up other kind of habits like this. So this is the problem. It's a big problem in the West. Not only in the West, all over the world, but it's especially it's there in the West. 
in Australia, for example, young women will want to have a child. At the same time, they won't want to marry. Because the thinking is that if I have a child, the government will give me a house and they'll give me money. They'll maintain me because I have a child. So they'll give everything. And I don't need a husband. Because if I have a husband, then I have to work for the husband. I have to take care of him and I'll, we'll argue and fight together. So why do I need a husband? I'll just have the child and the government will take care of me. And you, in this way, you have a lot of unmarried ladies with children. Okay, text, text number 40. As children are very prone to be misled, women are similarly very prone to degradation. According to Chanakya Pandit, women are generally not very intelligent and therefore not trustworthy. Would anybody like to comment on this? Do you agree with this? That women are generally very prone to degradation? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, I think women are more emotional mostly and that is an advantage also because they they take care of the children, they keep the family together, so they bring in that part. But at the same time, because they are emotional, they trust easily for mo most of the time at least. So uh, that's why it is, um, they they might be intelligent, but sometimes their, their intelligence is overcome by... Uh, emotions so it it could be you know it could lead them to a wrong decision sometimes okay yes yes looking at the second quote chanakya pandit says women are generally not very intelligent but actually we see a lot of women in the universities a major portion of the postgraduate departments are women everywhere not just only the arts, but the sciences also. All the different faculties. Women are there. They're very active. So, can we say women are generally not very intelligent? Yes, Jeevan Prabhu. Yeah, the one aspect is that uh, from the detachment point of view, uh, women are generally attached to uh, material objects. They take to Krishna conscious, women become the most intelligent, but generally uh, they are attached to uh, material objects in that way they are not intelligent. Women, women are attached to what? Material objects. Material objects? What, men are not attached to material objects? Yes, Maharaj. Well, Jivas are generally, uh, the conditioned souls are attached, uh, but in terms like uh, uh, sannyas are given to uh, men, but uh, sannyas is not given to women. Why? <laughs> so, uh, so, we can say uh, intellectual uh, sharpness in terms of uh, detachment, that is actually a great uh, boost for those in the male bodies. Well, uh, yeah, w women are not given sannyas, but not every man is going to take sannyas either. It's not a general rule that men will all become sannyasis. It's very, very rare that a man will actually become a sannyasi. So, I don't think we can hold it against women, that, you know, women are not renounced and men are. <laughs> you know. Most men are also not very renounced. Yes, Rajan Prabhu. Maharaj, here where Prabhupada is saying prone to degradation. 
so generally women are targeted by demonic people demonic men to pursue their own interest through women so yes rajan prabhu are you there we lost him huh? yeah i think we, we lost him maharaj mm-hmm. hari krishna yes manjari maharaj ji hari krishna guru maharaj uh, women generally women is intelligent it is uh, she is intelligent enough to understand but sometimes uh, she gets fooled by the flowery words of the demonic people and she uh, takes a trust on them and uh, that is the Uh, that is why she is not intelligent enough to understand uh, that she is getting fooled uh, in that case if someone wants to take advantage uh, out of it so because she is more attached to her bodily looks and uh, bodily happiness and uh, sometimes uh, due to the flowery words of other person who is demonic in nature she gets involved in such kind of so that is the reason i think although she is spiritually she is very uh, spiritually inclined even lord krishna says that she is medha uh, the intelligence uh, in chapter 10 so but she is intelligent enough to uh, uplift the children in that way spiritually but uh, sometimes she is not intelligent enough to understand the other demonic people and she gets fooled by them Uh huh. All right. Yes. Yeah, some some ladies can be easily misled. Hare Krishna. Yes. Maharaj, here the the intelligent is uh, referred to like only the uh, women those who are taking Krishna consciousness, or else uh, the women those who are keeping Krishna in their life. So those uh, Chanakya Pandita is saying that the women are not intelligent as regarding that. Uh, because uh, due to this material conditions she is also conditioned to many things the uh, woman so maybe like uh, it is very easy to fall a prey to everything but if the krishna is there in the center the, all the decisions will be taken wisely just because they don't have uh, krishna or spiritual aspect in their life they can mislead easily all decisions can be taken well won't be proper mm. yes and then or okay yes yes It's a nice point, Maharaji. I appreciate this. That women, devotee women, are certainly of a different nature from non-devotee women. But generally, we see that ladies who have come to Krishna consciousness, they're much more intelligent, and they have a higher sense of uh, responsibility. they're not so prone to be misled on the account of their education in krishna consciousness again that's not all women but it generally we do see that the devotee ladies are of a much higher uh, integrity much stronger character and much more uh able to protect themselves from the degradation of the material world so devotee women have a special place in this in the culture in the society in chanakya pandit's time were women not devotees well <laughs> some some women but not not much as it said women are generally not very intelligent so it's not all women but generally some women maybe more the majority and what do we mean by intelligence are we talking about material intelligence are we talking about spiritual intelligence is it's not just simply a an intelligence quota rate you know have the iq test get a rate 
how do you score in the IQ test, you know? It's not like that. But intelligence, we talk about actually being aware of our position, of our spiritual existence and our duties in the material body, in this material world, how we should be acting and what to be aware of. And so we see, therefore, in our Krishna consciousness movement today, we have ladies who are GBC members, and we have ladies who are in charge of big temples, uh, important centers in our Krishna consciousness movement. We see ladies taking charge and doing very well, and doing very nice jobs. They're very intelligent, and they're also trustworthy. So we're happy to see ladies take more responsibility. Women are just like we see women you know, drive airplanes and drive buses and trucks and so on. And we see also ladies running temples and uh, being, being managers and so on. It's become more and more common because ladies have that, they have more time to put themselves into it. Men tend to get more occupied with their businesses, with their jobs, but the women, they can fully devote themselves into Krishna's service and taking care of the devotees and looking after the temples. And they can work with all the ladies who are there at the temple. Generally, there's always a lot of ladies at the temple. So you have a woman in charge, she, she, she can get all the women organized. And that frees the men. The men are more free to go, to go out for preaching. So that's a good thing. Okay. Another quote from Chanakya Pandit. Chanakya Pandit says, Never trust the politician and women. Of course, when women comes to Krishna consciousness, that position is different. We are speaking of ordinary women. Krishna says in another place, striyo vaishya sudra. Right? That's uh, which that will be what? Ninth chapter? Striyo vaishya stata sudra tepi yanti paramgatim. That even one be of lower birth, like a woman or a Vaishya or Sudra, still they can attain the supreme destination. So here we're quoting Chanakya Pandit, talking about politicians and women. And sometimes you get also women politicians. <laughs> you get the two of them, so that's a big problem. But a woman who comes to Krishna Consciousness, that is different. We are speaking of ordinary women. We want to talk about violence. Violence also has its utility. Everything has its proper utility. Violence also has its utility from the purport of second chapter, text number 21. Now this is a very important issue for us as devotees. Just recently a devotee was asking me about violence. Uh, they were an initiated devotee and the lady was questioning about violence and did Lord Krishna actually, did he perform sacrifice, did he do these things? She was very puzzled to think that violence could also be used in Krishna's service. So here are some questions. What we want to do, how many people are here today? 48. 41? 48. 48. Okay, so then uh, 48, 6 eighths of, 6 eighths of 48, right? I think, yes, uh, need to create seven groups, Maharaj, so each group will have six to seven devotees. 
Yes, right. We'll have groups of how many? Seven, seven, seven groups. Seven groups of how many people in each group? Um, mostly six to seven. Oh. Mostly seven. Seven devotees will be there in each group. Okay. All right. So let's see first of all what they have to do before you put everyone into groups. Okay. Everyone, please note here are the questions. Violence also has its utility. First question is when is violence justified? Second question why did Krishna, who is all loving, incite Arjuna to war? Third question is terrorism in the name of religion appropriate or inappropriate. Discuss with reference to verses, analogies and statements from Prabhupada's purport from Bhagavad Gita 2.21 and 2.27. Please note, we want you to restrict yourself more or less to these two verses, 2.21 and 2.27. So three questions and we'll have groups, six, seven groups I think, and you can analyze these questions and then yes, pick a spokesman, each group should have a spokesman and we'll hear from you. Okay, so how long uh, should we discuss Maharaj this? Uh, five minutes? No, no, you need more than five minutes. So, uh, yeah, at least ten minutes, yeah. Okay, okay. So I'll create groups now. All right, thank you. Recording in progress. Krishna, what is here? We in room number four. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Okay. Okay. Hare Krishna. How many devotees in one group? Must be seven devotees. Must be in one group. So. Excuse me. Sikhar Prabhu, what is my group? Sunandas. Yes. Our group is number four. Number four? Yes, this is group number four. Mm -hmm. We are not assigned. We are not in the room yet. We are not in the group. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just a yeah. second. Give yeah. me give me a minute. Oh. Not group yet. Sorry, is there anyone who can create? I, I tried from my side, but it's not uh, happening. So yesterday, I think... Does anyone know how to create someone by Prabhu? Are you there? Uh, uh, come here, but then my internet is not very stable today. I think you should give it to someone else. Uh, Kavidas Prabhu? Yeah, I can help you with it. Yeah, you please. You want me to make you host, right? Just, 
Guruji, please mention the name and group. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, he is creating group. Uh, Kavidas Guru, are you able to see the options? You... Yeah, I can see the options. I can also see we have uh, one, two, three. We got actually seven rooms already set up. So I'm going to just open all the rooms. Um, yeah, okay. Let's give it a try. Harish, can you put me in a group? Kavita Yes, Hare Krishna, everyone. So the first question is, when is violence justified? So as it is stated in chapter 2, verse uh, 21, it is given that for the administration of justice, for the purpose of creating the state of justice, it is at times importance, important to actually adopt the very path of violence. So the answer is administration of justice and for the establishment of dharma, it is very important to at times adopt the very path of violence. So you are reading from uh, Prophet 21, Madhavi, right? Text 21. Yes, Prabhuji. It is yeah. given for the administration of justice, violence is justified. Yeah, So you just described about the third, third uh, question, right? Like, This yes, was the answer for question number one. When is violence so justified? Okay. Exactly. So in the course of one's duty, as it is prescribed in the Shastras, in oh, order no. to perform one's duty, at times we have to adopt the very path of violence. Secondly, for the purpose of administration of justice, violence is justified. Thirdly, uh, <coughs> one who is situated in pure knowledge, he has every right to adopt the way or the path of violence. So one who is situated in pure knowledge can or may adopt the path of violence. So these three are the reasons that at what time the violence is justified. Okay. And um, why did Krishna, who is all loving, incite Arjuna to go out? Yes, so that will be uh, for re-establishing uh, dharma. Uh, Krishna incited Arjuna to adopt uh, or to actually go ahead with the war for the purpose of supreme justice. Again, it is given in chapter two, verse twenty-one, text twenty-one. For oh. supreme justice, he incited Arjuna to go ahead with the war. Thirdly, for the purpose of re-establishing the dharma. He incited Arjuna to go ahead with the war. Where is the line of the tree in the purple? Okay. Uh, just a second. Uh, the last seventh line. Okay. 
Similarly, when Krishna orders orders fighting, it must be concluded that violence is for supreme justice. justice yeah. That Arjuna should follow the instruction, knowing well that such violence committed in the act of. Again, he uh, and why uh, actually Arjuna adopted or followed the instruction of uh, Krishna because ultimately he was acting for the supreme Lord, and it is it was the duty of every soul to actually uh, go ahead with the instruction or the command of the supreme lord yes, yes. again we can give this uh, this uh, reason for the first answer also when is one is justified whenever krishna is instructing yes. the soul at that time it becomes a duty of the soul to actually go ahead with the krishna krishna's instruction or command so whenever krishna is instructing at that time violence is justified yeah. And even we can mention that Manu Samhita, the law book of mankind, it is also that also supports the violence if it is done in right justice. Exactly. So the, the soul will get the next life, he will have to suffer for the great sin he has committed. So it will, how to say, uh, give him a chance to get a right birth at least. Exactly. We have three of, just three of us in this group. I guess everyone left. Okay, we can discuss the last point. Terrorism is in the in the name of religion. Is a terrorism in the name of religion or appropriate or inappropriate? Yeah. Of course, it is in appropriate. Again, we can uh, give reference that a surgical operation is not meant to kill the patient, but to cure yeah, right. him. To cure him, yeah, correct. Exactly. Uh, again, uh, from text number 27, mm -hmm. uh, we can uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, give a reference for question number two. The battle of Kurukshetra being the will of the Supreme was inevitable event and to fight for the right cause is a duty of Kshatriya. Okay, the first so that was, is the reason the Lord was... Second battle, right? Exactly. Yeah. To fight for the right cause is the duty of the Kshatriya. And Lord was actually inciting him to go ahead with the war because that was the actual uh, duty of duty Arjuna. Yeah. And Arjuna. also by, uh, how do you say, uh, not discharging his proper duty the last time, he would be able to, uh, he would not be able to stop the death. So death is anyway yeah. inviteable. Uh, and by That's just, right. yeah, how do you say, uh, avoiding his duty, he would be the wrong path. Exactly. Uh, again, uh, for the cycle of birth and death does mm. not, however, support unnecessary murder. Murder, yeah, slaughter and war, yeah. Slaughter and war. So anyway, the Bhagavad Gita is not, or Lord Krishna. So, I guess would you mind uh, to do a spokesperson for a group, Madhavi? I would be busy in <laughs> looping up. No, you, you go ahead, I, I, I'd say. I will be busy in managing everything. So mute and mute and... Okay. I'll so do I that. request you, Madhaji, please. Should we exit from the group, Madhaji? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Is everyone back? Uh, they, are, they, are, they are coming back, Maharaj. Okay, we'll just give another minute. Let everyone yeah, yeah. come back.
Okay, I think everyone's back now. Yes, Mara, almost Mara. I think four of three devotees are left, but you can carry on, Maharaj. Okay. So, we want to invite, maybe, well, let's start with group number one. Who is the spokesman for that group? Yes, whoever is a spokesperson for the group one, please raise your hand or unmute yourself and speak. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. I was chosen oh. to speak on behalf of group number one. Okay, very good. So please accept my humble obeisances and all glories to Srila Prabhupada. So, um, question number one, when is violence justified? Uh, we discussed that uh, based on, I think, a, a text 27 in the purport, it is said that the battle of Kurukshetra is inevitable and, you know, Arjuna has to discharge his duty because the other side, the Kauravas, they are, you know, they are performing adharma. So in order to uh, restore balance and, you know, to restore dharma, the, the war has to be, you know, executed and Arjuna has to fight to perform his duty. So also Krishna ordered Arjuna personally. So when the Lord uh, orders someone to do, you know, to do something that becomes the dharma. So we have to do it because Krishna said so. Okay. Um, so and then, yes, Maharaj. Is that your your answer for the first question? Violence is justified because um, you know when we have to execute dharma, when we have to uphold dharma, also when we have to defend ourselves in extreme situations. Otherwise, sometimes we have, you know, we can report it to the authorities. So that's the answer for number one. Let's wait, group. just wait before you go on. Let's ask uh, for, from the other groups. Would you like to contribute your answer for this first question? When is violence justified? Yes, Mr. Ketan Prabhu, you are from which group? Uh, yes, um, I'm from the group number four. So Maharaj, uh, I was just going back to chapter number one. Uh, 36 text, there are six kinds of uh, addresses uh, Prabhupada mentions about in the purport. So if you look at the uh, uh, Pandavas and Kauravas, Kauravas had uh, uh, performed all the six kind of uh, aggression. So Prabhupada says such aggressors are at once to be killed and no sin is incurred by killing such aggressors. So here in this case, this answers to when is violence uh, justified. Oh, you see, that according to the six acts of aggressors, any of these acts, then their violence is justified. Yes. And also uh, in the text 21 of second chapter in the purport, uh, Prabhupada mentions about a murderer uh, uh, to be, as per the law book of mankind, Manasamhita, it is supported that the murderer should be conducted to death so that in his next life he will ha not have to suffer for the great sin he has committed. Okay, yes, it's a, a good point that uh, a murderer generally should be hanged by the state and it, it's certainly the, to the advantage of the murderer, otherwise he will suffer in his next life. Yes. What about parents? Are, are, are they allowed to be violent with their children? No, Nowadays, of course, everyone's we're all influenced by Doctor Spock, is it? Then the, the 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 children can call the police if you if the parent gets violent with them. They can well, call. In, them. Yeah, in that case, the law yeah, is completely different. It's not according to the uh, laws of mankind. We have to refer back to the scriptures. What it is mentioned, how to raise a child. Uh, like Chanakya Pandit said, uh, Lalayet, Panchavarshani, Dashavarshani, Tadayet. So he talks about how to be at a particular age with the children. Uh huh. So um, if, if the state uh, law has been governed, we have to see if, is it authorized or not. Uh huh. What's authorized? And it's going to vary from state to state. Yes. Yes, but but in Kali Yuga we don't see those kind of uh, uh, leaders who 
really go as per the scriptures, the state laws or the lawmakers. What about, uh, you know, the current violence which is going on in the world today, for example, the war between Russia and Ukraine? Yes, dear mother. Is, is that kind of violence justified? Hare Krishna Maharaj, no, that sort of violence is not at all justified because Arjuna fought this, the battle of, uh, you know, Kurukshetra on the, uh, you know, uh, instructions of Lord Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God ahead himself to establish the dharma. But war nowadays or this Russian and Ukraine war, it is more of to, you know, uh, personal sense gratification in their personal agenda. Like I should have, uh, you know, all the power, all the land, all the money. So that is not at all justified. Well, you know, they do, they do, they do argue that that we have to defend ourselves. That the, the the neighboring country Ukraine is was accumulating more and more arms and was becoming a threat to the security of Russia. That's what they say. From the point of social security. Self-defense is a, an important principle. Maharaj, I have two points, uh, um, if, if okay. Um, yes. Uh, um, like, one thing is uh, uh, violence, even as a parent or even as, uh, you know, any person does. Uh, one thing uh, to me is, uh, as a duty when you do violence, like uh, army men fighting or a policeman fighting, uh, it is it is okay. In fact, it is awarded. But when it is if the same person is doing out of personal grudge, it is not okay. Out of personal enmity, if he kills somebody, he is punished. Uh, and second thing is uh, when uh, when nothing else works and as a way of defense, um, it is done. It is still okay. Like if if somebody is coming to kill me and to protect me. And while, while nothing else works, then it is fine. So in case of countries also, um, when nothing else works, it should be done. Like in case of Arjuna, he tried all ways. Until end, they tried to negotiate with uh, Duryodhan, even though Duryodhan tried to kill them. So uh, nothing else worked. So it was finally, they had to fight. So in that case, he should not uh, try to back out. So these two make, uh, sense to me, so I, I'm just mentioning Maharaj. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. Yes, interesting. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when is violence justified for this? As for Chanakya Niti, like we have to uh, first offer like Sam, Dam, Danda, Ve. In that also, Danda is also justified. <laughs> and it is really is and for the children, sometimes we have to use it for their betterment. Okay. That's it for Maharaj. Your children haven't called the police on you yet, huh? We are Indians, Maharaj. That is a beneficial point in this. Yeah, in the Western <laughs> world, you wouldn't get away with that. <laughs> nah. huh? We too grown up with the same. Mm. So, Maharaj, if somebody is some, as a parent taking out their anger on children, that is wrong. But as a duty to for their benefit, if somebody is you know, out of that that uh, awareness that they are doing for their children, then I think it is okay. But if if I am taking out some anger which is caused by something else to my children because they can't fight back, mm -hmm. then it is very wrong. Well, Srila Prabhupada did say actually he didn't want the children to be beaten. He didn't think it's proper. He didn't like that the parents would use violence on the children. He said, not good, not right. He said, you have to, of course, you may have to correct them, you have to correct them, but you don't have to become violent with them to correct them. If we simply give a proper instruction, well, then the child can understand. I think to resort to violence, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not very suitable, you know? It, it, it's just not necessary. It can be avoided just simply you give proper instruction. And nowadays we do find in schools, in the school systems also, 
they, they stopped the punishment, the actual uh, physical punishment, and they have other systems, you know, like they call the parent. The child's misbehaving, they call the parent to come, or they send the child home. They don't want the child in the school. So there are things like that. It's not that you have to, it's not that violence is absolutely necessary in dealing with children. We have to uh, be careful about that. And, you know, I, when I went to school, the teachers were using uh, physical punishment, you know, beating, beating the children. But over the years, nowadays, it stopped. They, they don't allow it. And instead, they just simply say, you, you, the child has to go home, or they will, they will call the parent to come to school. <coughs> And the parent has to come to school and he has to meet the teachers and the teachers will complain and say what's wrong. And in this way, it becomes a very unpleasant situation for the child. So the child will be more conscious about his behavior. But the violence, the physical violence, it's, it's not really necessary. It's not the ideal thing. Although we do say a life for a life, you know, if someone's a murderer, they should be hanged. But it, even in that, in that case, you know, an, uh, you know, the saying is an eye for an eye, a, a, a life for a... Uh, the whole world has become the blind, my father is Yeah, right. Everybody will become blind, you know, and nobody will have any teeth. So, is, is that what we want? No, of course. So violence must be very carefully controlled. But it, certainly it is necessary in certain situations. And Manu Samhita does say a murderer should be hanged. Uh, sometimes also a government will use violence if there's, for example, a lot of unrest in a country. There may be a lot of disturbance in the country, the people are viol protesting and doing damage to the country. And so at that time, the government may call out the army to suppress the violence, to stop all the damage. And so in that kind of situation, violence is justified to stop further damage and to stop the disturbance in the country. All right. But if we were to apply, uh, for example, you say, now somebody steals your wife, are you going to kill him? You know, your wife goes off with another man. You, you, are you going to kill that man for stealing your wife? Well, if you do, then you certainly go to jail. You certainly be punished. If someone takes your property, do, do you have a right to get violent with them? Well, if you try to get violent with them, you'll end up in trouble with the law yourself. Because we're not the law. So somebody's taking your property, you have to go through the authorities, you have to work with the police. You cannot just simply become violent yourself. You'll get in trouble. You'll be punished for that. We have to respect the authorities. Okay, let's go on to question number two. Why did Krishna, who is all loving, incite Arjuna to war? Let's hear group number one. What is your answer? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, so, based on um, uh, text 27 again, <coughs> Since the war was inevitable, was an inevitable event, it had to happen. So Krishna, had, you know, he incited Arjuna because he, his intention was to. So Krishna loves all of us. We are his children. Still, when we make a mistake, we have to pay for it. Something um, we have to. So um, also Krishna, um, while Arjuna was feeling very emotional because he was afraid that his relatives will die. But Krishna, now we are actually spirit souls. So in our text 23, it is mentioned in the translation that the soul 
cannot be destroyed by any, you know, by weapon. So, so if we view it from that point, uh, we can understand that all those Kauravas, they're not really dying. This is a mistake. Okay. Uh, all right, Prabhu, thank you. Now, can you hear some other contributions to this answer? Yes, Mukesh Prabhu. You are from which group? Hare Krishna. I am from group number seven. So, um, one uh, one point was that there is no difference between Krishna's loving and killing because the Lord is absolute. <laughs> yeah. The, Good. Yeah. <laughs> the example is uh, Putna, uh, who uh, came to kill Krishna, got the got the position of the mother in the spiritual world. So, in one sense, uh, they were actually on the winning side. The Kauravas were also winning in this uh, situation. Okay, but very interesting answer. Thank you, Prabhu. I have also have one more point, Maharaj. Uh, sorry for interjecting. Uh, there's a point number. Uh, violence and war are inevitable factors in human society for keeping law and order. That's verse number 27, uh, paragraph 1, ending line. But at the same time, war and violence are inevitable factors in human society. Okay, yes. Yes, some more, some more answers? Yes, Sunanda Das. Hare Krishna. Uh, <clears throat> the second question, uh, Krishna, in all loving Krishna, uh, Krishna states uh, to the Arjuna to uh, violence, uh, because uh, <clears throat> Krishna is all loving, that's true. And uh, what we, what, we, what we are saying now, uh, it is uh, for our own eye. It is not for Krishna's eye. Krishna is saying the, uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> uh, upliftment of the, uh, the other persons, those who are uh, very irreligious persons, for them uh, the violence is needed. Because Krishna's, Krishna wants this, to do that. Uh, so for Krishna's eye, whether violence or non-violence, it is all good for him because he's all loving. Okay. So it's all loving. Maharaj, I have a point. Yes? Maharaj, Krishna is insisting Arjuna to fight because in any case, he will not be able to stop the death of his relatives because Jatasuhi Dhruva Mrithu. So, he should perform his duty of fighting. Because everyone's going to die anyway, eh? Anyway. Okay. Yes? Yes, Manjari Mataji. Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, in the uh, 27th verse, it is uh, said uh, that uh, fight for the right cause is the duty of a Kshatriya. So, he should fight. And the last line, by avoiding the discharge of the proper duty, if one is not uh, applying his duty, and then what he, what will happen? It will the, uh, everyone will de degrade it, and the selection of the wrong path of action will happen. So this is also from the perfect twenty seven, and uh, even here in twenty one, soul cannot be killed. So uh, he should fight because soul is eternal, and uh, these uh, are already uh, actually died because. Spiritually died, I mean to say. Mm -hmm. so, okay, yes. So these are the point. Krishna is there, at, uh, he is commanding, so he should fight because he's Supreme Lord. Uh -huh. So he is giving the right justice to all these points. Yeah, we could, we could say, you know, that uh, when they were firing arrows, into Krishna, Bhishma was firing arrows, they were like uh, flowers being offered to Krishna, but they were arrows. And, and the wounds, the wounds on the body of the devotees taking part in the battle, Bhishma and Krishna and Arjuna, their wounds, are, the, the, the Acharyas compare them to the, a loving exchange between a young couple. There. And so, <laughs> The arrows were like love bites on the body of the, the way. It was uh, with arrows and <laughs> and but it's, it's you not. Know, they have a love 
a loving exchange with each other. And they showed that loving exchange by firing arrows into each other. Last point. Is ter terrorism in the name of a religion appropriate or inappropriate? Group number one. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, so we were unable to actually find um, quotations from the Bhagavad Gita for this question due to time constraint. But uh, we tried to come up with some answers. So we think terrorism is not appropriate uh, because, you know, in this movement, we are, our goal is to also, uh, de you know, develop an attachment for the Lord, to, you know, to have devotion, to love Him. So we cannot, you know, um, artificially try to love someone. So we cannot develop a loving relationship with someone if we are forced. So we have to understand Krishna. We have we have to want to approach Krishna. So we shouldn't force people. Yeah. So that's why Krishna also gives us our free will. He doesn't force us to love him. Okay, very good, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Someone else like to reply to this? Last question. Uh, Hare Krishna. Yes. Maharaj. Yes. Go ahead, Maharaj. Can I speak? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Religion means uh, loving God and loving everyone. So how can it is possible, like, to go for the violence and the under name of religion? Religion means itself is uh, loving God and loving all living entities. So that is the... Yes, right. You're right. I agree with you. Loving God means loving everyone. And not it's not something we want to do to create terror. Okay. Any other points before we go on? Any questions? Yeah, yes? we, uh, we didn't have enough time to discuss on this, but... Uh, we discussed that uh, it is not appropriate to engage in terrorism in the name of religion uh, because terrorizing people is uh, for anything is not right uh, only as a means to correct or only as a means to do the right thing over the wrong like dharma over a dharma it, it should be done like as a as it is mentioned in the 21 verse uh, as per manu samhita to correct somebody uh, for, for his sins like like murder and all it is appropriate to give him punishment but uh, as as a means to terrorize somebody or or a group of people is completely wrong so we should o overall be loving all the time only when needed uh, uh, and that too by authority uh, like like the uh, government or uh, state like that it should be used okay. not generalized yes okay good thank you Maharaj, uh, in terms of uh, russia ukraine war i would uh, just like to highlight that uh, the difference between sin and the ukra karma uh, sin corresponds to the individual person and whatever the most degraded sin mahapataka a person does that is prayaschita, atonement prescribed in the scriptures. But in the case of Ukra Karma, in the name of uh, uh, collective uh, work, in the name of uh, human advancement, and then acquiring weapons of mass destruction, the loss of uh, nature or Sanskrit, and there is no prayaschita or uh, atonement for uh, Ukra Karma. That's why. We can see in the conflict that many countries are raising the voice that the war has to be stopped. But still, it's going on. And so the purpose of life gets defeated uh, when the intelligence is uh, used in developing bombs and then nuclear arms uh, threatening to the humanity. Uh, so the uh, Udra Karma also uh, comes into picture uh, with regard to Russia. Okay, thank you very much. That's a very valuable comment. I appreciate that very much. Certainly, uh, Ukra Karma, there's no real atonement for that. It's just so wrong. It, uh, and cultivating weapons of mass destruction are so, uh, such a waste of the resources of the planet and create such a terrible, dangerous situation for the whole world. 
So we're certainly opposed to these things. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question here. Yes. Uh, so, Ugra Karma, like people are having, uh, the countries are, uh, you know, creating this uh, nuclear weapons. But when all the countries are having nuclear weapons, uh, like everybody needs it as a, as a way of defense, right? So how, how do we see that? Because well, uh, all over the world, it's going to be there. So if there is a war, we need as a self-defense. So. But no, I, I don't agree with you that we need to have self-defense. I think we need to be neutral when we just simply have to have nothing to do with these things. No, but sometimes uh, countries might <laughs> take you more seriously if you have them, right? They will not fight well, with you. Well, if you have them, then there's always going to be the tendency to want to use them. It's not that you can just have them and keep them there. You're always, there's always going to be the tendency we should use it. That's the danger. No, we have to. It has to. We have to understand that there has to be countries which will show the example, which will just simply have nothing to do with these things, and what they would just simply want the people to live in peace, without fear of weapons of mass destruction. If we have to have weapons of mass destruction just to defend ourselves. I think something's, th something is very wrong. It's very un, 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 not proper situation, not what we want at all. Just to add it, Maharaj, uh, whenever there is a foreign invasion, it means that the simple reaction has become mature. Whenever there is what? Foreign invasion, the simple reaction has become mature. Okay. <laughs> Sinful reaction has become matured. So we want to be cautious. We want to try out to avoid all sinful reactions. Okay, we're going to go ahead here. This is a quote from Prabhupada's lecture on text 26 and 27. The other side, Duryodhan, why he did not think in that way? Why Arjuna is thinking? Because he is devotee. That is the difference. A devotee thinks like that. A devotee does not like to kill anyone, even an ant. So many atrocities were done to him. Still, when the question of killing came, he was not very happy. No, this is Vaishnava. He is ready to excuse even the greatest enemy. So that kind of quality is, was there in Arjuna, that compassionate quality and the willingness to overlook and forgive the actions of others even though so many atrocities were done to them, but still Arjuna is willing to forget the past and to go on. He's ready to forgive. So that is Vaishnava. And then text number 36, purport, first chapter. The devotee of the Lord does not retaliate against the wrongdoer. But the Lord does not tolerate any mischief done to the devotee by the miscreants. The Lord can excuse a person on his own account, but he excuses no one who has done harm to his devotees. Therefore, the Lord was determined to kill the miscreants, although Arjuna wanted to excuse them. Okay, so you can see the difference. Now, Arjuna is so compassionate. Uh, Arjuna wants, wants to uh, excuse him, but Lord Krishna himself, he can't tolerate. He's going to take action on them. 
So this is a, an interesting point Srila Prabhupada has brought up. And he talks about the devotee does not retaliate against the wrongdoer. Now someone may attack us. What do we do if somebody attacks us? How should we react? Generally, we, 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 we don't want to get involved in fighting with people. Somebody attacks us, are we just going to let them hit us? <laughs> well, we don't want to retaliate. That's the point. If they do attack us, we may defend ourselves, we may block their blows and so on, but we, we don't want to retaliate against them. The retaliation will be done by Krishna. Krishna doesn't tolerate any harm done to his devotees. So Krishna can ex excuse a person on his own account. Somebody does something wrong to Krishna, Krishna can, for, can overlook it. But somebody does harm to his devotees, Krishna can't tolerate that. He's going to do, he's going to take it. And similarly, if we see somebody else attack a devotee, we should be willing to go there to the defense of the devotee. We may not retaliate ourselves, but somebody attacks a devotee, we should not just stand by and watch. Rather, we should go to the defense of our devotee and protect the devotee against the wrongdoer. But somebody attacks our own self, we, we may tolerate. Understand? That's the etiquette. Another quote from Prabhupada's lecture on 2627, first chapter. If you insult his devotee, the devotee may excuse, but Krishna will not excuse. This is Krishna's position. Therefore, be careful not to insult a devotee. A devotee may excuse you, but Krishna will not excuse you. Krishna is so strict. He cannot tolerate any insult to his devotee. Therefore, this arrangement of fighting, Arjuna wanted. No, let them be excused. Krishna wanted, no, you must fight, you must kill them. <laughs> okay, so Prabhupada is describing Lord Krishna's desire. It was Lord Krishna's desire that Arjuna fight. Arjuna didn't want to fight, but he, finally he fought because Krishna wanted him to fight. As Prabhupada said here, Krishna wanted, you must fight, you must kill them. So, <laughs> this was Krishna's position. Krishna would not excuse. Okay, so we explained the significance of the phrase dharmam samvadam. Do you remember? Dharmyam samvadam, 18th chapter, text 70. Meaning? Anyone remember? Yes, Maharaj, uh, reading Bhagavad Gita is equal to worshipping Krishna. Worshipping Krishna with our, in, with, our in, with our intelligence. Yes, with our intelligence. One who studies the Bhagavad Gita is actually worshipping Krishna with their intelligence. Dharmam Samvadam. Okay, and then Chapter 1, we summarized. Do you remember the main points of the first chapter? How did it begin? Vitrashtra's doubts. Okay, and then? Duryodhana's diplomacy. Yes. Devotee, I request please raise your hand and speak, please. Okay, the, uh, Dhritarashtra's doubts and then uh, Duryodhana's diplomacy and that's followed by? Yes, Madhavan Signs of victory for the Pandavas. Signs of victory for the Pandavas, yes. And then? Uh, Krishna is Bhaktavatsala. Ah, yes. Very good. Yes. And finally, the last section? The four reasons of Arjuna not to fight. Yes. What are the four reasons? 
compassion um of sinful fear of sinful reaction and uh, um no enjoyment and yes. uh, destruction of dynasty very good yes very good right so arjuna's four reasons for not fighting we heard just now and then destruction of the dynasty listed the progressive steps toward destruction of the dynasty how did it begin Hare Krishna Maharaj um for it's big it begins with the death of the family elders yes the death of the family elders and then that's followed by um eternal family tradition is vanquished yes and then that, after that the family becomes involved in irreligion mm -hmm. and then then degradation of uh, womanhood uh huh uh then it will it will be unwanted progeny yes. varna shankara yes and, and community projects and family welfare activities devastated right these are the six steps to destroy the dynasty right this is what's happened in the history of our dynasties the history of so many dynasties how happened like that Okay, academic integrity. We spoke a little bit about the appropriate and inappropriate application of the statement. Women are generally not very intelligent. Now, if we say that all women are not very intelligent, that's not correct, right? We have to apply it in a very careful manner. So appropriate what is appropriate that women who are generally not devotees then they're not very intelligent they have no krishna consciousness even though they may be well educated by material standards they may be they may be postgraduate students and so on but if they don't have krishna consciousness we don't have a good opinion of their intelligence <coughs> we don't think of them as being very intelligent without having krishna consciousness so in some cases it's appropriate but not in all cases we have to consider very carefully women are not very men are also not very intelligent we can't say only women men are also generally not very intelligent because in kali yuga everyone is sudra or lower so how can we say oh the women are inferior to the men of course the women they have the problem that they have to give birth to children that is a big problem that women they they have to get pregnant and they give birth to children so they have that problem men don't have to worry about that okay and then preaching application we've been talking about the principle of the use of violence in relation to the battle of kurukshetra and current issues of religious violence we have to understand kurukshetra war it was a dharma yudh it was a battle it was meant to be anyway dharma yudh in the beginning it was meant to be fought according to religious principles and it was up until the killing of abhimanu and after abhimanu was killed in an unfair way then from that time on then the 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 code the 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 shatriya code was forgotten about and and they took advantage of all different situations to do killing and violence but initially the battle of kurukshetra was meant to be dharma yudh it and also it shatriyas who've all come to fight it's not like today religious violence today so many innocent people so many innocent families are victims they drop bombs they kill so many innocent people women and children they they don't care that is the nature of 
the, this kind of uh, religious violence without any kind of discrimination. But Kurukshetra, at least, it was Kshatriyas, men who had come there, ready to give up their bodies in battle. And so it was a different affair. Okay, a final quote from Srila Prabhupada. Bhagavad Gita is spoken by the Lord so that human society can be perfectly organized from all angles of vision, politically, socially, economically, philosophically, and re religiously. From any point of view, human society can be reformed by the Krishna Consciousness Movement. From the Madhya Leela, chapter 19, 167, purport. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Are there any final questions from anyone? Anyone? Has, anyone has any questions? Hare Krishna Guruji. Yes, Rajan Prabhupada. I want to ask a question. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, I had a question about. Uh, degradation of women here. So, currently in the media, what we see that the situation is because of some legal rules or the media feminism movement, it's getting the situation very irreligious, even for men and for women also. They, it, it's only into more focus on the materialist perspective, rather they're, they're not even able or willing to listen to any point from the sasa. So how, and while we're working in the atmosphere, in like in corporate offices, we come across all this teasing and everything. So how do we deal there? I mean, if some situations arises. Well, <laughs> You have to understand you're dealing with non-devotees, people who have no faith in Shastra. They're actually basically demoniac. It's very difficult to try to uh, convince them of anything. And you might be better just simply to ignore them and keep a little distance from them, rather than trying to work with them, rather than trying to, uh, you know, preach to them, <laughs> that's certainly a very difficult thing to do. You have to consider the situation and you have to consider the qualification of the people. Are they actually innocent and are they open to hearing? If they're not, if they're openly antagonistic and atheistic and offensive, better just to leave them, keep away from them. And also, because of media, business houses and government, government are making rules in a such a way that this, it only ignite more religion in the society or in the country. And as a society, as a movement of religion, what should we do, I mean, not to go against government, this is also beyond our capacity. You mean, and how do we keep ourselves, like our closed ones, out of this? You mean the government's favourable to the religion or they're not favourable? No, they're not so favourable to the religion. The new rules that that's are coming up in, in terms of like a family relations are very demonic in a nature. Like too much, too much inclined towards one gender and there's a lot of, these are things in India, I feel it's going, which will break the marriage society, marriage society of the country. And somehow, not sooner or but later, the influence of Western media, the example that you gave about Australia, will, will come in India also. So, how do we keep our families, maybe, um, not in a leader leadership position, but the close ones, the relatives, out of this, this loop? Well, you keep them away from that 
uh, aspect of the modern world by bringing them more into Krishna consciousness and encouraging them to associate with people in Krishna consciousness society through the Krishna consciousness movement. It's the only hope to save us in this Kali Yuga, in this dark age. We have to take shelter of the association of devotees. And we have to be convinced in the teachings of the scriptures. And so, it, of course, it's also a great challenge because it's really not easy to bring family members into Krishna consciousness unless it's from their very birth. If you're fortunate that from the very birth of the children that they, they can be taught Krishna consciousness, then it's not so bad. But if it's coming somewhere in the middle of their childhood and they're not used to it and some change, then it is difficult. It's a real challenge to try to bring children, to get children to make them Krishna conscious. And Srila Prabhupada brought up his own children. He did his best to make them Krishna conscious. But it wasn't such an easy thing and it didn't have such a great success. He actually said that the disciples he got in the Western world were more devoted and better children than his own seminal children. So you can't be too much attached to these things. You have to be tolerant and you have to, you know, do your best, make the best of a bad bargain. That we're here in this material world and there are problems, there are things, situations which are not pleasant. We have to live with it, we have to live through it and we have to go on and become Krishna conscious. Always keep your mind fixed on the goal. The goal is we want to go back to Krishna and develop love for Krishna. That's the important point in life. To everything else is secondary. But always remember Krishna, never forget him. Then the life is successful. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, some other questions are there? Some other hands are up? Yes, Ms. Maharaj Prabhu. Prabhu, mute, unmute yourself. Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj? Maharaj, nowadays we hear about a controversy in Islam about female Diksha Guru. Can you throw some light about that, Maharaj? Well, uh, in the past, in the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, there have been women spiritual teachers. For example, after Lord Nichananda departed from the world, Janava Mata became an Acharya and she had some disciples. And then there was another lady who was the daughter of Srinivas Acharya. He was a prominent preacher in Bengal. And so he, he, he is a, his daughter, Himalata Thakurani, she was a very special lady. And from a very childhood, she grew up as a great devotee. And she went on also to become an initiating spiritual master. And so sometimes people would ask Prabhupada, are women able to become spiritual teachers? And Prabhupada said, yes, it's possible. He said, it's not common. He said, it's very special, very rare. But there are histories, there are instances, and according to the philosophy, women can do it. Now, it's just difficult in some countries more than others. Some countries, you know, like in India, for example, men are more prominent. We see men more than women. Ladies are, you know, it's, you know, some countries you go to, you, you find a lot of women everywhere doing everything and running everything. But in India, we see it's much more men everywhere. It's a man's world in India. So some people, so the devotees in India, they feel that they definitely want to have men who are spiritual teachers rather than ladies. 
But in other countries, like in Western countries and so on, they don't worry about it. They're, you know, they think no problem to have a woman guru, let a woman initiate. But it's an unusual thing to have a woman sit on an elevated seat in front of a male audience. Uh, you know, the, the, the male audience are often conditioned souls and they're going to come and sit in front of a woman. Now, of course, the, so the woman who's doing that service, obviously, she, she shouldn't be a young woman. Even, even the, the Diksha gurus, the men, they shouldn't be so young. They should be of a, a mature age that they can uh, handle that position. But particularly for ladies, it's important that they should be elderly ladies, mature ladies. Mm, they must be very careful about taking on this kind of position. It's not a very easy thing. Even for men, it's not very easy. They have, we have had some problems sometimes. People became spiritual masters and decided they, want, they gave up. So, with, with caution. But philosophically, it, it's definitely possible. It's just a question of, it's not for all women. It's not for all women, but for a, maybe some special woman that she's able to do this service. Uh -huh. But some parts of the world, they're not favorable. They don't want to have women gurus. They feel it's not, what, not appropriate. They just want to keep it with the men. Uh huh. Yes, another question here. Uh, yes, <coughs> yes, Maharaj. Uh, yeah. I want a simple. I want to ask a simple question. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the difference between violence and terrorism, as per Sri Well, terrorism is something which is illegal, which is done just to terrify innocent people, right? It's the use of violence to just bring terror and to, to try to, to injure and even kill innocent people. That is terrorism. Violence uh, is something which is directed usually, maybe directed more towards an individual rather than a mass of people. Terrorism generally, they like to get a mass of people, and and just and destroy a whole mass of people. But violence is more focused on an individual, on particular person or something like that. And yes. violence can be, it can be physical, it can be also mental. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yes, is, is that one hand up there, Prabhu? Yes, yes. Hare Krishna, Gurudev, just the last question here. Uh, Gurudev, we discussed about, uh, one Mataji pointed out that uh, as countries we need to have armaments to protect ourselves and that's an impetus for peace. Uh, and I, I understood uh, from the answer that no, we shouldn't be having our arms, but should be neutral. Uh, and and there, uh, there are many examples without going into the detail where we have seen a mass exodus of a certain sect of people who were following Hinduism or uh, part of Krishna consciousness and and in such situations is it just good to accept what's happening to hundreds and thousands of those people accept it as our destiny or should we fight back 
because the concept of everyone eventually losing their armaments and everyone being Krishna consciousness at the moment seems utopia. It may not be, it will not be. One day everyone will be. And this is what is the mission which Prabhupada started. And we are all soldiers for him, foot soldiers. But till that situation comes when generally a large majority becomes Krishna consciousness, should we not be protecting ourselves? Thank you. Well, Hare Krishna. <coughs> My, my personal feeling is that we, <coughs> we take shelter of Lord Krishna for protection. Krishna protects us. Then when the devotees asked, what should we do if the war comes about and the bombs go off? And Prabhupada said, we would just chant Hare Krishna. Prabhupada didn't say, oh, we should get bombs and get guns and we should be fighting. He said, no, we will just chant Hare Krishna. And so I think this is our mood. We have to show an example, you know, as religious people, we're speaking philosophy. And I don't think it's uh, really on us. It's not our nature, first of all. We're not trained in these things, warfare and bombs and so on. We don't know anything about these things. And it's not really something which we're really meant for. In the times of the, the war, the, uh, in the times of the Indian, what was it? Uh, oh, Subhash Chandra Bosch was... Uh, recruiting people for his Indian army. And he asked Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada that you have a lot of men there. Why don't you give some men for the Indian army? But Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada said to him, he said, no, no, he said, these men, look, he said, they're all weak and thin. They're skinny. He said, they won't be good fighters. He said, just let them, leave them as they are. Let them chant Hare Krishna. He didn't, he didn't want to give anything, any man, he didn't want to get involved in the war. And so I think this is our position, that we should just simply, our business is to become Krishna conscious. And whatever happens in the way of warfare and so on, that's going to happen. But it shouldn't distract us from our business, which is chanting the holy name and worshipping Krishna. And we leave it up to Krishna. Krishna is the, the door. Right? Krishna wants to protect us. Mari Krishna Raki Ki Raki Krishna Mari Ki. We depend on Krishna. No, we, this is my feeling anyway about the whole issue, you know. But to get involved in uh, <laughs> warfare and bombs and armies and so on. <laughs> this, is, this is not our business as devotees. To protect ourselves, Krishna gives the protection. Depend on Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Madhuji. Uh, yeah, about that women being guru. Uh, I think in India, for a uh, from ancient time, we have seen some examples. Not always, but some examples were always there. That you know, a really qualified, uh, matured, uh, spiritually advanced uh, lady would be a guru. She will be accepted by everyone, as long as she is, you know, uh, God conscious. So. Many times, even now, we see that Bhagavad uh, uh, Katha is done by women and so many people, thousands of people watch it, um, even over the television and... Uh, oh, so I, yes, I think, yes, I agree with you, Madhuji. Yeah, very nice, yeah. Certainly yeah. it's true. There's a lot of women preaching very nicely. They're preaching very nicely. But generally, it's 
it's better that women preach to women. It's not very much appreciated for a woman to be preaching to men, a lot of men. Mm. You know, and also I think uh, it should not be generalized, uh, I agree, because sometimes women become too uh, enthusiastic and, you know, they might fall into some, some trap or something which is not correct for them or for others. So, yeah, it should not be generalized. They have to be spiritually advanced. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's under discussion and, you know, they're certainly considering it. There's a lot of people very favorable and at the same time there's opposition. Some places there's a lot of opposition to this. So it's under discussion. Okay. The problem comes uh, that, you know, some places where it's, uh, people really want it and they do it so that, you know, when they come to other places where they didn't want it, then it's a problem. You know, if, like if a woman comes to an area where they don't have any women gurus and the woman comes and she starts having her guru puja or something, or her vyasa puja or something, then it, it can be a problem. It's yeah, a, and especially women preaching to brahmacharis or sannyasis is a big uh, should be very nicely done. Yes, generally women, you know, it's good for them to preach to women, you know. Yeah. But yeah. you get some men, you, you know, so there, there was one lady, there was one of the, came from, not from a ISKCON temple, there was this other lady came, and she came to visit a Hindu temple. and So I asked one of the men who went there, you know, you went to her lecture, I said, how, what did you think? How was her le He said, oh, she had nice eyes. <laughs> you know, that was uh, what he took out of her lecture. You know, he was sitting there, you know, and all, because she was a young woman, and she was a young woman, and she came there, you know, with her hair untied, hanging over, long hair untied, and saffron robes. And so that kind of approach. And, you know, some places they do it like that. And that's, of course, not what we want in ISKCON. We don't have... Yeah, it, it takes a lot of maturity. It takes a lot of maturity, even on the woman's part and overall. Too. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this, this is... Uh, someone's got a hand up here, isn't it? Hare. Yes, Mariji? Yes, Mariji. Yes, Maharaj, I remember one incident uh, like from Neelamrita of Srila Prabhupada uh, that when uh, India was uh, facing the, with the Britishers the problems and then uh, Subhash Chandra Bose was his classmate or maybe one year uh, senior to him and then he didn't join the arms and he didn't, many students, many of his classmates, they joined with uh, Subhash Chandra Bose and in making our uh, arms and armaments and then uh, but he says, no, uh, we have to follow Ahimsa, like Mahatma Gandhi's rules, we should not uh, be making these arms. So, uh, that also gives a point that we should not be uh, violent in any case. We should be neutral and we should believe in Krishna. And that time, uh, when uh, he, uh, this, this was going on, uh, then uh, Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Thakur also uh, told him that this time, when Prabhupada told him that this time India is facing the problem, no one will listen about Bhagavad Gita, no one will. So then he said, the important thing is, first important thing is to spread the message of Bhagavad Gita, then this uh, uh, freedom from Britishers. So if we get free from uh, our material bondage, then of course we will get free from our independence. Okay. So from dependence from Britishers. Yes, right. Yes, Prabhupada was arguing at first to Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati that we need independence for India, but Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati enforced on him, enforced on our Srila Prabhupada, that Krishna consciousness couldn't wait for some political adjustment. We're not much more concerned about politics and political situations and 
military actions and so on. We, we just simply want to spread Lord Chaitanya's movement. And Lord Chaitanya's message is peace and love. We don't see Lord Chaitanya anywhere encouraging fighting, or act, great actions, physical, any physical up, uprisings or anything. Okay. And in this, uh, Prabhupada didn't take the degree also. He didn't have the degree also. So he fight in that way, not with the arms. Okay. Didn't fight with guns, right? Yes. Fight by preaching, by kirtan. Prabhupada said, we'll conquer the world with Rathiyatra. <laughs> All right, any other hands, any other questions? On your response, Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, since we got you, I'd like to utilize this opportunity by asking one question. Uh, we got from your introduction uh, that uh, you can teach us uh, how to increase our absorption in chanting. If you can throw some light. Well, more, more chanting. To get absorbed in chanting, do more chanting. And chant loudly. Louder you chant, more powerful it becomes. So more chanting and louder chanting. That's a secret. Okay? Thank you very much. All right, we'll finish here tonight. Thank you very much. We'll see you next weekend. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Recording stopped. Jai. Jai.